Well, hello there. It's time for Blick Art Materials Live again. And tonight the demo is going to be a collage project. But before we get started tonight, let's talk about our giveaway because I know a lot of you are excited about that and you're excited to tune in and get your name in for the drawing because come on, who can't use $100 worth of art supplies, right? All right, we've got a new prompt for you tonight. Okay, first of all, you have to like and follow us on Facebook and why would you not want to do so? We've got awesome demonstrations a couple of times a week and we've got some great contests and things like that in between. And tonight's prompt is, what's your favorite paper? This is our focus tonight. We're going to talk about paper because it's collage and I would just be really interested in knowing what you love about paper. Um, even if you're a digital artist or photographer, you love a certain photo paper, um, even if you are doing sewing, embroidery, those kind of things, you still have a favorite sketchbook or something. And I know watercolorists, pastelists, uh, drawing papers, you guys are very uh, sold on a certain type of paper, I'm sure. So please uh, go ahead and tell us what your favorite paper would be. All right, well, I've got an assistant here in the studio with me tonight. I've got Abby, and um, we're going to, she's going to feed me any questions that she might have. And so go ahead and tell me anything that you want to know. I want to start off a little bit. First of all, let's talk about collage. Collage, we don't see a whole lot of videos out there about collage. Um, it's like an umbrella term. Let's just say, I told you tonight that we're going to do a demo on painting. What? There's all kinds of different techniques about painting. And collage is the same way. So we have to choose one little one, and it's going to be a uh, demo on portrait making today. Um, collage in itself is has been around for forever, really. But about a hundred years ago, um, artists started really making it popular about the time of the Surrealists and the Dada artists because they were using anything and everything to make art with. So fabrics and cardboards and different papers were being used and unfortunately we've lost a lot of those pieces. These were the renegades. These were the rebels. They were trying absolutely anything. And some of the things they used were not very long lasting. So let me tell you a little story about my own, about one of my failures, okay? Many, many years ago, um, when I first started working for this company, we wanted to do a torn paper collage and we made a catalog cover out of it. So this is a press copy of a Van Gogh uh, take, of course, Wheatfield and Cypress Trees. But if you look real close, there's some art supplies in here. There's a palette, there's a paint tube, there's a Crayola, we've got some words in here. And we took old catalogs, tore them up, and made a paper collage out of it. Pretty cool idea, right? Now. Let me show you what this piece looks like today. I'm just going to reach over and bring this in. Can you see that? Have I got any reflections on it? All right, let's compare, shall we? All those beautiful bright yellows, they're gone. There's grayish, brownish lines in between everything. Now, some of the greens, they're still there, some of the pieces, but look how much they faded, those blues. Now, we did a great job. We loved this thing. So we framed it up, and it's been hanging in the office ever since. But had I known, I think I would have approached it a little more more wisely. So. We learn from our mistakes, and then we get to teach others so that they don't make the same mistakes, correct? Let's walk through what I did wrong, shall we? First of all, let's talk about glue. 
I used something called rubber cement. Rubber cement was great because you could reposition the pieces. You could stick them down and move them around. However, rubber cement's a natural material, so it yellows and oxidizes over time. And so that's what has happened with some of this. Today we have PVA. Um, you're familiar with that term perhaps? It's poly polyvinyl acetate, acrylic resin basically. And almost all of the glues that we use are some form of that. Um, however, one glue is not the same as another glue. I've read some disturbing things online saying that you can use glues interchangeably because they're all made with polyvinyl acetate. Um, but if you look at some of our, our more scholastic glues, perhaps, you'll see that they're not really saying that they're acid-free or that they're archival or that they're non-yellowing or anything like that. Different glues are water resistant. They might have uh, permanency variances. They might have UV inhibitors. They might have um, bacteria inhibitors. They're all different. So if you ever need to know anything about what glue to use for what project, please call our product information specialists or click the chat button when you're online at dickblick.com and we'll help you get the right glue for the right project. Let's talk about paper now as well. Paper, of course, made from wood, and a lot of our papers that are less expensive that we use for things turn yellow. Why is that? It's something called a lignin. Now, lignins are what is in a tree that helps us to be strong and grow tall. Without lignins, we wouldn't have trees. We would have mostly bushes, uh, small trees. They give it strength, they're a natural water repellent, bug repellent, and when they're in paper, because they're a natural material, they tend to turn yellow. We're familiar with craft paper, of course. Paper bags, nice and strong and stiff because it's full of lignans. Old paper, such as I've got with the sheet music right here, uh, this turns yellow, newsprint turns yellow, it's because of lignans. And the catalog pages that I used in that piece were also uh, inexpensive paper full of lignans. Now, in our art papers, our white papers, our drawing papers, um, the manufacturer makes as much effort as possible to remove those and to replace them with buffering agents that make it acid free. You want to look for acid free paper. That way you won't have surprised yellowing. I didn't know that when I made my piece. Put that back. Also, light fastness. And we get a lot of talk about that. Um, but you can do things to help with light fastness. Uh, when you're using in magazines and um, in our catalogs, the inks, the printing inks that we use, they're not light fast. They're not meant to be. There's no reason to be. It's inside of a catalog. It's tucked away. It's not going to see light. But we can tend to make things more light fast. First of all, by sticking it under glass. That will help matters. Secondly, by giving it a UV coat, even, even just a clear coat, such as a varnish. That'll help make things more light fast. Or you can look for a spray, such as I've got a golden spray that says right on it that it has UVLS. Those are uh, UV inhibitors. So I'm not so concerned about light fastness because you can fix things like that. It's when things are inside of a surface that are uh, eating it from the inside out. So enough. We've learned a lot, haven't we? Did, did, did you guys learn something? I hope you did. And if you happen to miss at the very beginning, um, I gave us a new prompt tonight. I would love to hear from you guys what your favorite paper is. We're talking about collage tonight, paper collage, and I just thought it'd be a good idea to ask you guys to tell me about your favorite paper. Let's move on to the demo, shall we? One more problem that I had when I did my picture was the surface. 
I did not use an acid-free surface. And tonight, for my demo, I'm not going to use an acid-free surface. This is um, an acetate. This is going to be a clear window that I can work through, but because it's my piece is not going to remain on the acetate, I'm not too concerned about the acid, the acidity level of it. It's just a temporary thing. I have an image here of a beautiful model, and I selected this one first of all because I'm able to get the face pretty large. There's a lot of uh, good contrast in here and it's a stock image. I know it looks like a celebrity, but I do want to caution you um, when creating portraits of celebrities because the photographs are copyrighted. And a lot of times we find a photograph and we use it into our artwork. Um, fair use, uh, definitely there is fair use just for your own private use, but I'm on a video, so I need to have something that is not copyrighted or that I paid for, which is this stock image. I'm going to put this piece of acetate over the top. Anybody want to know what you can use besides acetate? I usually get questions like that. Um, anything that's clear and flat. If you were doing a small piece instead of a large one like I'm doing here, you could use a sheet protector, perhaps. Or perhaps you have a, a stiffer piece, maybe a, a styrene piece like inside of a frame. That would work just fine too. It doesn't need to be a, the same weight that I'm using at all, just something that's flat and clear. All right, you've noticed I've taped it over the image that I intend to use so that I can get it to stay on the table. Next thing I need to do is I'm going to paint some paper. This is actually going to be a painting with torn paper. So to start out with, I'm going to get some drawing paper out. And I've got my pad right here and my paint. Tonight, I'm using some Blick acrylic. Uh, the reason I selected that is because it is a softer body. And since I really don't need to have much in the way of texture, it can be pretty flat. So I'm going to just use kind of a student quality paint. Abby, how is everybody tonight? Well, I'm getting this out. Everyone's doing pretty good. Any questions for me yet? Not yet. Not yet. Oh, you will in a minute, I'm pretty sure. All right, we're going to paint levels of gray onto these sheets. So I'm just going to pull this over probably a little bit more. So you can see I'm mixing up kind of a light gray. I've got a titanium white and an ivory black. And I'm gonna mix up grayscale pieces and paint a sheet with various levels of gray. Now you can paint the entire sheet one level or you can paint smaller areas. Now the reason I am going with grayscale tonight instead of diving right in with color is because I learned in my painting just how valuable it is to work with values. And I think if you were doing this for the first time, if you were doing this with students or you're a student learning, it is a really good idea for you to concentrate on values first before you get sucked into color, especially with skin tones because there's so many variances of skin tones. And really, the color is the veil that goes on top. It's the light, it's the dark, it's the shadows, it's the highlights that give us facial features and tell us all about uh, a particular subject for a portrait. And if you have that structure in place, then the color can be added on top of that. So that's why I am going with grayscale portraiture tonight instead of showing you 
how to do this with colorful pieces. Now, of course, you could do it with colorful pieces. I have some, a sample right up over here to my right of a, a building that was done with the same technique, done with color. However, that adds a whole nother part to it. So I'm just going to put that aside and we're going to create a grayscale portrait tonight. Okay, I have some pieces that were dry. And I made a piece white. You could just use white paper. Of course, it has a little bit of texture. And you could use your watercolors for this. You could use, of course, more professional acrylics. You could even probably use some grayscale markers and color some uh, grayscale markers onto the page and use that as well. But it's dry and it's ready to go. So I'm just going to set that aside for a moment. And I'm going to show you a demonstration now. I'm going to start, I recommend, in the very detailed areas. Because when you start covering this piece with paper, it's letting in less light. So it gets a little harder to see what's underneath there. So I usually start in the most detailed and important areas, the eyes. And if you want to give me a second, I'm going to bring in a camera here so that you can watch along a little, a little more up close. Okay. Got my camera on a tripod here so I can bring you in just a little closer. All right. Now, I'm going to start with the shape of the eyes here. And Julie, can you turn the camera around? It looks to be upside down. Oh, really? Okay. Absolutely. My technical advisor out here, Rick, has informed me that I seem to have the camera upside down. Not surprised. Sounds like something I would do. How's that? Is that going to show it, Rick? I'm going to move it in here. Have we got it facing the right direction? Yeah, that's good. All right. <laughs> yeah, I suppose it would be better if you could see it facing the right direction. Okay. I'm using tonight some Aileen's tacky glue. Um, Aileen's is non yellowing. I can rely on it because it's very consistent. And I'm just going to tear a piece of paper about the size of her eyeball there. Now, to start out with, for these details, of course, you can use some scissors. I'm not going to tell you that you absolutely can't. The look of torn paper collage really relies on the rough edges, but these, of course, can be background, just covering the white area. So I'm not going to concern myself too much other than just getting the right shape. Okay, so I'm just going to put a little bit of glue. I did not want to oversaturate that at all and put it over the top. Now this is where it helps to have a reference photo because once you get one in place then you can't see underneath it. And let me dive and get my reference photo here. So I just happen to have a second one on hand and now I'm going to cut the circle that goes in the middle. Now if I'd been on my game, I probably would have cut this first before I glued down so that I had this in place. But I forgot to do that and I just started gluing. I think it was that upside down camera thing that got me. <laughs> okay. Now's the time to start tearing. OK. 
Okay, so for an eyelid, let me look at some of my colors here. Find something rather close. I'm going to tear a piece off and one of the most important things I learned when doing torn paper collage is that you don't have to be as exact as you think you do. All right, made that a little bit thinner. And we're going to pull that in over the eyelid like so. Just an arch shape. Okay. Now we want to go a little bit darker around the shadowed areas of her eyes here. So let me pull in. Let's see. I've got another little sheet here that I've started. And while I'm at it, I just wanted to remind you, and for those of you who are just starting to join us here, that we are doing a $100 e-gift card giveaway. And all you have to do to enter to win is to tell us what your favorite paper is. I'm using tonight just a little drawing paper that I have painted with some Blick acrylic, student grade acrylics. And allowed the paint to dry. Like so. And I'm just kind of following along. Do you notice how instead of trying to make one one shape to fit in underneath her eye line here, eye lid. I am actually creating that shape out of three different torn pieces of paper. That's easier actually. Now I can get around that curve without having to be exact with the tearing. And I just kind of save my little pieces off to the side here. Who knows, as I'm going along, I might actually need that exact shape. So I hang on to them. And you don't need much glue. I, you know what, I'm doing this off camera. Let me show you. Do you see how I just have a little line of glue there? Seriously, you just need enough to get it to stick down. Some of the pieces are rough. They're raised a little bit more. And that's going to be okay. I'm going to do a pure white highlight underneath her eyebrow there. When I'm done, I will be coating the entire thing. So if I have pieces that are raising up on the corners, I'm not going to concern myself so much with that. Okay. So Abby, what are some people's favorite papers? Um, we've got some mixed media paper. We've got some people saying of all kinds of paper. All right. We do have some questions about your paper. Okay, we have people who are using mixed media paper, which I love myself, and we have some people who just love paper in general. I hear you there. But we also have some questions. Yes, Leslie would like to know if the acetate is archival and why not glue it on vel vellum. But we also have some people wondering if you could just explain the types of paper you're using. Absolutely. Okay, so somebody's wondering if the acetate that I'm using is archival, and it absolutely is not archival. Um, 
There are types of films, such as one called Duralar, which many of you are familiar with. There are types of films that are more uh, stable and acid-free. This is not that. Um, it's less expensive, of course. And the reason I'm using this instead is that I will actually be taking this off once it's done. It does come off of the acetate, so I am not going to worry about it as much. And what was the second part of that question there, Abby? The papers that I'm using right now? Yeah, if you could just get into some more detail about your papers. Absolutely. So all I've done is I've selected a drawing paper not a sketch paper. I think sketch papers are generally lighter and also sketch papers contain those nasty, well not nasty, they're very good, but they contain those lignans. And lignans tend to cause yellowing over time. So I've selected a drawing paper and I have painted these drawing papers using our own Blickrylic brand. I'm just going to pull that out a little bit there so you can see the label um, and allowed it to dry. You could use many other kinds of acrylic. You could use your watercolors if you wanted to. I have painted pages instead of just drawing paper. I've used pages. As a matter of fact, why don't I, let's see, I think I have one underneath here. Rick, have we got the, the tall overhead camera there? Okay, you can see this. We have some painted pages here where you can kind of still see the words through there. This, of course, has already got the yellowing done to it, which I'm okay with, depending on what my project would be. So you can use just about any type of paper. And what other questions do we have there, Abby? I hope I answered that one. You could use medium to glue the paper down, absolutely, absolutely. Um, I would use a fine brush because as you can see, I'm using some very small, smallish pieces of torn paper. And you could use a fine brush and allow medium to be put on there. That would be, that would be a good choice actually. All right, see how I'm just, these are tiny little pieces that I'm, I'm tearing right now, and I'm about to get away with that, from that, so just hold with me a moment. See how that nice little curve kind of describes a little bit of the eyelash there as well. Okay, now let's talk about some of these larger areas of skin here. I can see a highlight right here, and I want to keep that highlight fairly white. So let's get some white paper and I'm just going to tear kind of a, a circle that is about the shape of that highlight. Now if you would have the ability either as a phone app or say you have a program after photo program such as Photoshop you could posterize your image first. And what I mean by posterize is break it down into just a few levels of gray. And that makes it even easier to follow along. I know a high school teacher that does this project with their students. And the students always use a posterize portrait or a posterize image to start with. Once again, I am not making exact shapes per se. I'm just looking at this area and filling it in with smaller shapes. Think of these shapes as a brush stroke or you can also think of it as a, as a puzzle. And you're putting one piece together at a time to create the puzzle. Any other questions for me yet, Abby? Um, well, actually, right as you said that, yes. Okay. Um, Gigi 
would like to know if you could paint over the torn pieces after they're glued to refine the detail. Gigi, I know you join us a lot, and I want to thank you because uh, you sound really cool. You've got a lot of great ideas. And uh, Gigi, yes, your question about being able to paint it first and then putting your color over the top of it, that would be very cool because you could have uh, some great texture, you know? Look, look at the texture I'm creating with this. That would, that would be really interesting. And I would love, love to see that, that take place and see that happen. Um, the reason I've, I've pretty much chosen to do the grayscale is because I kind of look at this as a learning experience as well. To be able to look at how values develop in a facial structure, where you, you're really looking at what's where and where the shadows take place and where the highlights take place. It's right there in front of you and you're really forced to look at it. Just pressing it down a little bit. All right, so I could keep going on like this. As I mentioned, I started with a detailed area. And you can kind of see it's getting harder and harder to be able to see what's under here. I keep a reference photo handy, just another photocopy of the same image, which I, I now have gotten a little bit of paint on, but I've kept it handy so that I can, I can look back over there. If I've covered something and I want to go back and take a look at it again, then I have this, this reference photo that I can take a look at as well. Now this could be, and Gigi, back to you with, with the idea of this just being the launch pad. This, this could just be the start of it and where you could go from here. Um, you could add drawing mediums on top of that. You could come back in maybe with some colored pencils or, or you could come back in and uh, smooth out some of these transitions. Although I, I truly love the torn edge and the rugged transitions here. And it might not look like so much to you right now, but I'm going to set it aside for a moment here and I'm going to bring out a piece that's already finished. So let me put my camera away. And I'm going to untape this piece. And I have one that's finished that we can take a look at now and talk about some of those things that you can do to it after it's done. And I just want to remind you one more time because it's, we did kind of change things up on you tonight. Some of you may have responded to some of the prompts that we've done before, but tonight's prompt is, what's your favorite paper? I remember my friend Whitney and I having this discussion of what it's like to go in a Blick store and we've got all those beautiful decorative papers on display and you just want to touch them and feel them and there's just this whole tact tactile, beautiful, beautiful thing um, about paper. And I, I'm kind of gathering that some of you guys who are artists, artists as well have that same love of paper. So if you could tell me what your favorite paper is, we will get you in the drawing for a $100 e-card. All right, so this is my finished piece. It is a little smaller. I decided to blow it up a bit for uh, our, my demonstration tonight just because I really wanted you guys to be able to see what it was I was creating. And I was able to get a little bit uh, larger demonstration. So this was just an eight and a half by 11 image. Um, let's go back to my reference photo. Once again, I took some liberties with the hair to make it flow a little bit more. You can do that. That's okay. And now I want to show you the back side because as I mentioned, this comes off. You can take it right off of that acetate and reuse the acetate for something else. Teachers, keep that in mind. This is really an 
inexpensive project when you're able to reuse items. Look at the back side. Isn't that almost just as neat as the front? To be able to see the, the little bit of color coming through with the dark and all of the different textures. Yeah, you just might want to use the back side as much as you'd use the front side. Okay, so one of the mistakes that I made, as I mentioned earlier, with my Van Gogh torn paper collage was using a background that was not acid free. And so that background lent itself to many of the problems that I had as well. This is just a piece of illustration board. However, I know that it's acid free. So I'm going to, I can glue my piece right on top of this, or I kind of think it's fun to build a background first. So let's talk about some of the things you could use on the background. We can, of course, use some of the same painted torn papers. Perhaps you want to work some color in this time. Um, decorative papers, though not acid free, could be worked in a little bit here and there. We have a very lovely, I call this a cloud paper, um, Unryu. Not sure if I pronounced that right. I guess I never really learned exactly what the correct pronunciation is, but I call it Unryu paper. Let's see, here's, here's a pretty decorative paper. And I'm keeping with the torn paper theme. You could do a photographic background if you wanted to. Anybody have any ideas out there, background you'd like to do? Here's some things that I cut out of magazines. I'm just going to give a little tear to the top side here, and that way I can actually get it to curve a little bit. No, they're not going to be light fast, that's for sure. But I can always do things to make things light fast. So we could use magazines, we could use book pages. Oh, I've got some old sheet music here. I could just tear some pieces of sheet music out and use those. How about you guys? Do you have any ideas? What collage elements do you like to work in? We have to make sure that we're not using copyrighted materials, of course. Or if we are, we're using them in such small portions that they are completely unrecognizable. Any thoughts from you guys on collage materials that you like to use? Oh, Suzanne, of course, you could use fabric, like printed fabrics. Yes, absolutely. Picasso, George Brock, they used a lot of fabrics in their collages. Lisa also says yarn. Lisa says yarn, absolutely. And we'll get into these a little bit, too, because sealing a collage is the most important part of it. So, I'm going to just put her there for the moment with a little bit of glue on the back side. And we'll just pretend that I have the entire background finished. And now, to finish it off, wait till the glue dries, first of all. Um, the glue will only be uh, permanent if we allow it to dry first. But once the glue is dry, you're going to use something called a polymer gloss medium, or you could use matte medium, or you could use something called Mod Podge, or uh, any of a clear acrylic medium. And you're just going to cover the entire piece. 
and this is going to push down any of those little pieces of paper that are sticking up that didn't quite get glued down. This is going to help those to stay down. It's going to seal them up so that they don't come in or come up again. Let's just put a little bit underneath here and we can push it down. I would let this dry and I would come back and give it a second coat. If you don't like brush strokes, because gloss medium does give you brush strokes, if you don't like brush strokes, you could always use a pouring medium, which is self-leveling and gives you a much smoother surface. And if you're using things that are going to fade, should they happen to get into sunlight, then you can come back over the top with an archival varnish, such as the golden mat here that has a UV inhibitor in it. So that will reduce any inks that I would have here um, that will help it to be more stable and last longer. Final questions coming up, and then we're going to take all of the people's names who took all of the names that told us what your favorite paper is. Um, and we're going to draw that out and have a winner for you shortly. This is your final call. If you haven't told us what your favorite paper is, um, do so now and we will get you in the drawing. Any questions, Abby? Michelle would like to know approximately how long does it take for the glue to dry fully so that you can remove the piece from the mask? All right, Michelle, that's a very good question. How long does it take for the glue to dry fully? Um, so that you can go ahead, that you can remove this off of the acetate. It's going to be pretty quick because while I'm over here and I'm working on certain areas, um, then I'm going to come back over here and I'm going to be working over on this area. This is going to be drawing. So it's really the, the final areas that you're working on um, that need to dry. And you probably only need to give them about a half an hour, 45 minutes, and we're talking with the Eileen's glue that I'm using. Eileen's makes a quick dry tacky glue that I could use as well on this, and that would only be uh, probably 20 minutes for it to dry. Um, I don't think it's dry enough to remove now, but I could be wrong. Yeah, I'd give it a little bit more time. I see that it's sticky, but you can probably see that it's, it's getting close to where it could be removed from the acetate. But I'd give it a little bit more time than that. Any other questions about this? You know, I hope you guys do collage. Um, I think collage, especially this painting with paper type thing, is a, a very exciting medium. You can work all kinds of different things in it. I hope I've inspired you. I know I was inspired by another artist doing collage and uh, it led me to experiment and try a number of different things and I hope you do too. Abby, how about it? Do we have a winner? Do we have any more questions? We do have a winner. Oh, we have a winner. Yay. Our winner is Ellie B. Ellie B. Ellie, you are our winner tonight. We have a $100 e-gift card with your name on it. So all you have to do is private message us, give us a message, uh, messenger, uh, let us know that you've heard this and that you want to claim your $100 e-gift card, and we'll find out where to send it to you. Um, everybody else, I really thank you for joining me tonight. And uh, join us again on Thursday. Vic Hollins is going to be our guest artist. And if you're not familiar with Vic, uh, you'll need to Google her, her work ahead of time because she does pet, pet portraits. And they are completely amazing and so full of life and so full of energy. You're going to want to watch. So thank you for joining me tonight for Torn Paper Collage.